Thanks for the reminder. Um, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Bill Dietz up to the podium uh, for closing remarks in our next part. <clears throat> um, good afternoon. I'm Bill Dietz. I'm a member of the Roundtable on Obesity Solutions, and I'm here at George Washington University. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the final session, uh, which consists of three panelists, and I'd, I'd like I'll introduce them as they come forward. Uh, Don Bradley, who is the, um, a professor in the Department of Community and Family Medicine at Duke University. Sympathies for last night. Um, <laughs> Ruth Peterson, uh, who is the director of the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at the CDC. And Marjorie Innocent, who's senior director of health programs at uh, the NAACP. Uh, this session will begin with just five minutes of comments from, from each uh, panelist, uh, followed by an open discussion. Keep your eye on the uh, timer. Okay. Um, so, first, I, I think we all need to congratulate Shriki, the planning committee, and the presenters for an absolutely engaging uh, <laughs> workshop. I want to make, I guess, four points. Um, one, and it, it is in some ways we're supposed to be summarizing what we heard. I will put my own bias and spin on this uh, since that seems to be my privilege. Um, one is that words matter, and we heard a lot of words um, here. I would point out a couple of them. One is the term empower versus power. Uh, empower is something that you give to somebody as opposed to recognizing self-efficacy. Just uh, minority versus people of color. People of color are not minor people. They are people. Um, I would also health care, health, and then health and well-being. And I always try to use those terms together. Uh, person first language, uh, tip of the hat to Bill, who kind of reminds us about that uh, all times. And then social drivers of health rather than determinants. It's not a fait accompli. So that's my, my language commentary. Um, I guess the, one of the other things that I got out of this was that racial inequities need to be viewed in a much more granular perspective. Uh, we heard the differences in Asian communities and uh, his, uh, <laughs> Latino, I forgot one of my words, Hispanic versus Latino, the Latino community. So we just need to be looking a lot deeper in that. Um, the third is that racism and white privilege have to be acknowledged. I would suggest that all of us in this room were privileged. Uh, a number of us are white. There is kind of the uh, historical racism. There's institutional racism. And then there's kind of individual or personal racism. And I think unless we, and we talk, and Dr. Chin talked about or fearless conversations in that regard. Um, I would, I also think when we do that, we have to think about the population. And there's a book I would commend to folks uh, written by Jonathan Metzl. Um, which is uh, dying of whiteness, why the political resentment is killing the heartland of America. So some of it is we're going to need to have this in a language that some parts of the population can hear, and some of it's a whiff them or a what's in it for me. Because right now, the whiteness and the resentment that's there is really killing the population, that group, that really is supporting some of the really horrendous policies that we see. And uh, last is that I think policy systems and environmental change, um, taking the, the dose uh, perspective, are really what we're going to have to pay attention to. Thank you. Ruth? Oh, thank you. And I'm going to build on what Don just said about granularity. But you also can't compete against each other. So we have limited resources to address health equity. So you have to keep in mind that health equity as an overall issue is critical. And everybody in this room has passion and the vision that Shariki laid out this morning, that health equity is a vision, is really important. They can't hear me from my phone. <laughs> Can you hear me now? 
No. Now, you no. Can. now it's green. Okay, there we go. So, so I think that it's important to remember there's different levels of health equity, this granular level, but the highest level, too, of our vision. I also think that it's important to think about the fact that we actually do know what works to some degree. So sometimes we get hung up in that we don't exactly know what the secret recipe is. But if you allow these evidence-based strategies to go into communities where there are specific priority populations, and they apply their secret sauce for what their community cares about. So we see that with these community needs assessment that our grantees have to do. They also meet the, as was mentioned, the IRS regulations for hospitals, but state and local public health have to do community health needs assessment. They have to look at what matters to them. We ask them to do evidence-based strategies around physical activity and nutrition, but there's many iterations of that that they can do based on what their population wants to look at to some degree, and racism and overt racism and threat and violence are something that our grantees actually really think about. And our REACH um, recipients, racial and ethnic approaches to community health, they teach us. So what we see is we see where rural areas understand that food insecurity has to be addressed at their church level and their faith-based organizations. So they want to know how to apply dietary guidelines for Americans to that work. We see people who are threatened on the streets in the Midwest because of their religion now need safe places for physical activity and there are community-based organizations that open up these places. So they're meeting our evidence-based guidelines in a tailored way that meets their population. So the last thing I'll close with, there's this theme that we don't know what works after the science is done, sometimes that I hear. So what do we do? We have the study. We know what the effect size is. What, how do we really make sure that this works in a community? So I would ask people to pause and trust the communities. There's a lot of people in public health and there's a lot of community-based organizations that can actually figure that out. So we don't need to be completely stressed out about that or hold things back because we think we might not have exactly the effect modification and size that we want. We can actually do it at the ground level and we can do it because we have a workforce that is ready for it. We had 51 applications from states that were approved but unfunded and we could only fund 16. We had 261 reach applications. We could only fund 31. All of those were approved but unfunded. What does that mean to this country? It means that because of our investments in previous public health investments, we have a workforce that understands how to write a grant and a policy system and environmental change and how to tailor interventions to meet the needs of their priority population that they've identified. Thank you. There you go. So there is so much that's been said today that resonated. And first of all, I really want to say a big, a huge thank you uh, to Shariki and to all of the speakers for laying such, um, I'd say, terrific groundwork around a very challenging conversation. The other members of the uh, roundtable are well aware that this, the need for this conversation is one that many of us have been talking about uh, for some time. And the way that it was done and the depth with which it was done is absolutely fantastic. Um, so, so we're in the civil rights space, right, as, as an organization. And what you were just talking about, sir, uh, certainly resonated uh, very much with, uh, with me when I think about the, the work that we do. And when it comes to the health work that we, that we do at the uh, NAACP or NAACP, it's fallen largely in two categories. One is definitely the federal um, health policy advocacy or the federal policy advocacy work that includes health. That's the work that you know, I think most people know us for. And then there's another component that's really focused on uh, really working with our affiliates, which of course are very numerous all around the country, and not surprisingly, a lot of their efforts have really focused on raising awareness about chronic diseases and uh, really preventing them and certainly helping to mitigate, if you will, their, their impact on health. When it comes to advancing health policy, that's more, much more unfamiliar territory for them. And I note this because that's not the case with education. It's not the case with criminal justice. It's not the case around housing. It's not the case around employment, around income. 
um, even environmental and climate justice. And while there's some, I think there was a very, very good case that was made today for some um, civil rights related, I'll call it, uh, work that's been done from a policy standpoint to really help to ensure access to health care to some degree, my argument has always been, and I have actually honestly yet to hear anything that convinces me otherwise, that the extent to which we take health seriously enough in this country for everyone to ensure some really uh, progressive rights around health ain't happened yet. And so the extent to which we certainly have to address the challenges that we experience around health through a social justice lens, which of course means looking at the social determinants of health, are very, very critical. We've, we've heard the case for that. But we also have to recognize that the ongoing challenges within the healthcare infrastructure itself, within how it is that we even identify or think about health and healthcare, still we've got a long way to go. And so from the standpoint of being able to advance uh, the work that we do with the association and a lot of other um, organizations and entities do in their own space but also collaboratively, to really redefine how it is that we think about health, how it is that we address health, how it is that we incorporate health within all policies is something that we have to do. It's very steadfast work. It is very necessary work. And it is work that must be done, certainly within each of our spaces, but also in how it is that we talk with um, our elected officials and our policymakers about the appropriate solutions. Until we really start to advance those kinds of efforts and continue to put, um, frankly, what I'll call sustained, um, informed, uh, even aggressive, but very, very, you know, just constantly on it pressure to really, really change the dialogue around policy solutions in each of our different areas, right, but also undergirding how it is that they, inf um, they influence health, we're going to continue to see the kinds of very siloed approaches that continue to happen and that, quite frankly, get used um, constantly to pit ourselves against each other. That's one. Two, um, when I think about the work that we do, I had a very, very interesting um, experience this past weekend. We have a, a series of civil rights advocacy and training institute uh, trainings that we do in each of the seven NAACP regions. It's an effort that was going on, was cut because of funding. It's now back and um, came back last year. Now, it's actually in Region 5, which is southeast region of the country. And we were talking with the affiliates there, um, had, I think it was about, third, about 30 or 40 uh, folks that were there uh, for the, the, the health session. And we're talking about um, really you know, thinking about health more holistically, first of all, and not just thinking about you know, the traditional approaches that they've used, but also talking about um, civic engagement and really working with their, their uh, communities in a uh, much more open and uh, really uh, respectful way and really engaging them in both thinking about what some of the challenges are in the community and how it is that folks want to move forward from an advocacy standpoint and recognizing all the different assets that they have in the community. And there was a, a particular gentleman, I'm guessing we're about in the same, uh, same age group, he might be a little younger, and he said, you know, we have a different way of thinking about health here, but also we're in an interesting space and time. And I know he's talking about the whole country, but it was very clear that he was also talking about his particular context, where he is. We were in Columbia, South Carolina at the time, and he is based in South Carolina. And his concern was that there's so much going on right now with pushback on so many levels, including around basic civil rights, like voting, <laughs> like survival, that this feels like an additional ask, but also something that seems to be necessary, but just seems to be so inaccessible because there's so much concern around basic survival right now. And it was such an important reminder for us at the national office, right, in Baltimore, where I am, and certainly in a different part of the country, that for a lot of folks who do civil rights and social justice work, they're always tired. <laughs> they stay tired because there's so much to do. But they're particularly weather beaten right now. And so as we sit here and think about what needs to be done, I think we also need to be very mindful and just cognizant of some of the challenges that they're facing literally, um, and especially you know, throughout different parts of the country, on a day-to-day -day basis with the social and political affronts that they just face 
just on the, the basic premise of what it is that they do and what it is that they look like. Um. Please. So I want to conclude where Sharihi started. Um, and I'm surprised that this hasn't been shown uh, before this minute. Um, <clears throat> but this is a framework that Shariki drafted now two, two years ago, I guess, or three, perhaps. Um, and I wanted to, to use this to remind us that most of the work that's been done around obesity prevention and control um, has been around behavioral change, uh, which is necessary. But I think what we heard today, that it's not sufficient, and that for the first time today, I think, we heard about um, the, some initiatives around building community capacity. Um, and uh, we heard that from um, Dr. Kahola Kula's uh, presentation and uh, Dr. Hare Joshu's presentation, where there was community empowerment and engagement and capacity building uh, around the issue of uh, obesity change. <clears throat> um, Dr. Jernigan talked about convenience stores, uh, which really increase healthy options. Um, and we don't yet have outcomes other than uh, changes in consumption. But it may be quite a while before we see changes in, in the prevalence of obesity. But um, there are the, I was struck by the, there have been two major investments in um, multi-center obesity prevention efforts. Uh, one called GEMS, which uh, was published in about 2010. The other called COPTER, um, the Childhood Obesity Prevention and Treatment um, Research Group. Um, and of the, of, the, of the four studies in, in those groups that have been published um, with state-of-the-art behavioral change strategies, none of them really saw a difference in the uh, trajectories of obesity change. And these were directed at... Uh, African-American or Hispanic populations, children 10 to 11 years of age or uh, preschoolers, um, low income. And I think that emphasizes that unless we have the capacity to join those behavioral interventions with these community-based interventions, we're not going to succeed. And we're not going to be able to really resolve the substantial disparities um, that exist. Um, and uh, I was glad that Dr. Simon um, mentioned trust. Because I think what we heard today um, is that in addition to the bias and stigma that we all know and accept uh, that accompanies obesity, that this trust is even harder when it's uh, on, uh, addressed on a background of racism and colonization and displacement. Uh, and that if we're going to empower communities, we need to begin at the community level. And, and one of the uh, interesting opportunities that I think what we have is something called group model building. Uh, which would engage the community around these kinds of problems and perhaps come up, uh, or likely, I would say, come up with innovative solutions that we had no idea about because we're outside the communities. Um, but I also, the, the other thing that um, I'm, I'm struck with, and, and it only came up peripherally, uh, but it's been something that I've been uh, increasingly concerned about, is this literature on ultra-processed foods. Um, and there's now a, a growing body of literature that su suggests that ultra-processed foods are associated with increased rates of obesity uh, and uh, increased caloric intake on a, on a daily uh, basis, as well as increased mortality. And when we think about the um, environments in which so many groups uh, like African Americans and Hispanics exist, where they're dependent on corner stores for their uh, food supply, they're consuming ultra-processed foods. Uh, because of the lack of availability and, and pricing of, um, of foods that are, are healthier, the more basic uh, types of foods. And that, pre that presents a conundrum that goes all the way back to the agricultural production system that we have um, from, from farm to fork, which is uh, heavily subsidized and directed towards uh, the, the development and, and, um, and subsidization of ultra-processed foods. Uh, the final point uh, is... OK, so how do we begin to change these systems, and particularly these community systems, um, when, in fact, um, the NIH, for example, invests in the behavioral change therapies, um, but, in fact, the challenge is these environmentally-based uh, strategies that are needed. And if those environmentally-based strategies save money, who pays? Uh, because it's the health system that, that, uh, that gets the benefits. 
And so I think that uh, this was, to Dr. Chin's point, we need to not only restructure the way we think about care and the way we think about these interventions, but we also think, have to think about how we change the payment system so that these services, which are critical, I think, uh, to address the, the substantial disparities that exist with obesity, um, that, that this payment system has to also change uh, alongside it. So I think we have a few minutes for any final comments before I turn this back to Shariki. So I think that means everyone's eager to hear Shariki's closing <laughs> comments. Um, thanks for the chance to, to have the, the last word here. Um, I really want to say deep thanks to those of you who, who came to share your ideas and those who came to, to listen, participate in the audience and those on the, on the web. Um, the only um, thing that I want to say at this point is this, I've got, it says 10 minutes, but I'm not going to have 10 minutes, <laughs> is, is that um, out of this workshop should come something different. And uh, I think everybody who's here and who's listened uh, could really make a contribution by thinking about what can we do differently. What, what time is it in history? And what's possible to disrupt some of the patterns we've seen? Uh, we are, unfortunately, I think in the obesity community, we, we say, We've been doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, because we haven't been able to break out of the uh, mold, and because we know that some of the things we, we are doing work, um, but they don't work alone. And I do appreciate uh, Bill's putting up the, the framework that came out of the discussions at this round table, because maybe the next thing to do is to really work hard on joining the solutions we have. I think the individual behavior is always going to be important. We know some things about it, and we don't know other things about it. The policy and environmental change, uh, thinking about the, the a project that, that Valerie mentioned, appeared to me from listening to be much more community engaged in creating that environmental policy change than we've been doing. You know, the, the finding out what people prefer so that it, it will sell. Uh, we have some, some examples of um, things that didn't sell <laughs> once, the, you know, once the environment was changed. And so uh, I'm not sure that you know, the roundtable um, doesn't conduct studies or, or whatever, but we do try to think about things that can take action. And maybe out of this workshop, we can call out the good recommendations so that when we come together again on this topic, when other studies are done, we are not talking about problems like the ones Ruth Sombrana mentioned that have been the same for 40 years, and we haven't even picked up the needle, much less moved it. So I'll stop there, and thanks again. <laughs>